certainly we're for questions we're gonna have yeah. folks just line up here. That's Actually leave that one up there. That's an good. organized way to do it and just ask one question at a time and we'll go from there. Hey Megan. Hey Carl. Um, I, my name's Megan. I work for Solar City and I also a spokesperson for the Alliance for Solar Choice. We're big proponents of net metering. Um, so I just wanted to push back on a couple of things that you said. I couldn't stay here and not do that. Um, you, you mentioned a couple issues with net metering, and, and that's definitely not perfect. Um, but I would argue that now there's a value of solar tariff. Um, in the first place, I know Austin's value of solar tariff changes on a yearly basis. Right. right? Um, so it's reevaluated every year, which makes it pretty much impossible to finance. Um, here in Colorado, finance systems make up about 80% of um, residential systems because few of us can afford to pay twenty dollars or $30,000 to put on our roofs, right? So we can't finance systems if the rate changes every year if there's no certainty in that. Um, at the same time, I think Austin, they just lowered their rate. So I think it's about retail right now, or is it lower? It's a little above. It's a little above. Um, but there's a chance it could be less than retail rate, which, which isn't a great deal for, um, for rate payers there. At the same time, it's sort of odd to consider that all of the generation that your system produces is you don't use any of it on site technically because you sell it all to the utility so you buy all of your consumption from the utility and then sell it all um, sell everything you produce to the utility <coughs> um, that's called the buy all sell all mechanism and because you do that um, you aren't technically allowed to claim the investment tax credit which covers 30 percent of the cost of your system um, because energy needs to be used on site um, if you're going to claim that also, for value of solar payments. Okay, you're gonna make the list too long for me to remember, so give me, give me another one and then I'll, I'll give you, and then I'll give, I'll give you I'll, just I'll, maybe yeah. two more really quickly. Uh, for value of solar <laughs> payments, you, um, you, uh, that's, that's taxable on a federal um, basis, unlike net metering, which is, which is just credit. Um, also for net metering, I think you were talking about the Texas model, but for most, most of net metering, there's any, you have um, monthly rollover. So if you, you still wanna conserve when your system is producing, um, because that rolls over, you know, hour to hour, day to day, month to month. It's just at the end of the year, um, you have to true it up, and then you get the avoided cost rate. Um, and then finally, the value of solar. We, we all, we definitely should know the value of solar. That's helpful. Um, but as someone who works in the industry, I'm exhausted, and I don't have time to interface with every utility out there um, and put together one of these studies. So net metering is just it's fair credit. It's um, it's sort of you know fair compensation um, without all of us having to get into value of solar studies all the time. And I know you said the utilities could do it, but I mean, who really trusts the utilities to fair, fairly value solar because not everyone's in uni. Um, I think that was all. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, yeah, this is, this is interesting, and I, I don't want to turn it into too much of a geek fest here, but um, uh, the value... I'm going to say, so yeah. So first, the first sort of thing is, well, if you relook at what the value is every year, and the way that's the way we designed it into the tariff in Austin, in Minnesota, by the way, they put it in as a 20-year rate. They just set a levelized rate and set it for 20 years, but um, that creates uh, um, too many changes in the value that the customer receives. And if the stream of value the customer receives for their solar is unstable, then nobody will finance that. And um, that's just, um, see how I, put, put, how I put this nicely, that's just flat wrong. Because with net metering, the rates can be changed by the utility anytime they want to. And so your retail rate changes, so your value of solar can change, the value you're getting for under net metering can change anytime the utility changes their rates. Any, 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 there is no stability in the compensation value that you get from net metering and residential customers, unless they're working through a third party lease company, are not doing financing through secondary market loans. They're using line, home equity lines of credit or paying cash. And they're not, um, this, the, there isn't a well organized financing market for people who buy. The lease companies, their main concern is that their investors get their investment tax credit because that's I sort of, the lease right, save our customers. right, that too, yeah. that too. And so, so, but anyway, so there's no, their myth of stability is not there. It, we have had relatively stable rates, but they haven't been very stable. And the thing about the value of solar is that 
it's based on the cost you avoid. So a lot of us think that we're actually pretty much at a pretty low level in natural gas prices. As gas prices get more expensive, value of solar will actually grow. What happened in Austin was that they recalculated based on lower gas prices and the value went down. They also manipulated the formula a little bit, which you have to, you have, to have a utility with integrity. On that, I will agree. And they manipulated a little bit in a negative direction. But there's mostly upside for solar customers under value of solar. And rather than waiting 18 or five years between rate cases for a readjustment of that value, you get it every year. So you solve a problem that geeks call regulatory lag, which is that every time you need to catch up with your net, your net metering value, you have to wait for the utility to hit a rate case. And finally, rate cases are not done with solar in mind. Nobody goes into a rate case in a utility and says, OK, now when we're setting these residential rates, let's make sure we set a residential rate that is fair to our solar customers. They don't even think about solar customers. OK. so. Those were a couple of them. Um, gosh, and I had several of them. Yeah, okay. I made this point too. This is really important, okay? It turns out, first of all, the name doesn't matter. It's the structure of your rate. If you structure a value of solar-based rate to be a buy-all, sell-all, like a feed-in tariff structure where the customer does sell all their electricity, you will lose your residential investment tax credit. So we went, I use lawyers and language and structure to avoid that problem. And so did the state of Minnesota. So there's, what you do is you do a credit, not a sale, and other mechanisms that indicate that this is generation for use, not for sale. Now, I'm not a federal tax accountant, but I've read their memos. And even the lawyers that Megan has hired said exactly that. The structure is what is important, and you have to structure these rates right. So that's critical. Take that guidance. Don't structure it wrong. Structure it right. Uh, but you can avoid the tax problems. And even if you want to get on the other side of the tax situation, like some people do with commercial customers, they still get the business tax credit for solar, but it's much too complicated to have on a residential customer. But it might be the perfect solution for commercial customers. So it's worth thinking about. I'll leave it there. Any other question? Next question. Yes. Uh, any new technology or materials coming online that are going to change the efficiency or the cost of installing? Yeah, you know, last about a year ago, I was out with some of the guys from the lab um, who are still working on some pretty exciting stuff in the 3.5 group for thin films, and, and they think they can get to some higher efficiency. We really, we're hopeful for some, some efficiency bumps in thin films because they have those lower costs, and they've been kind of held back by low efficiency, even though they have lower costs. I don't think we'll see that on your rooftop as soon as we'll see it in large solar farms. Companies like First Solar trying to push it through. Uh, Rommel Nafi, who, who sort of heads up that solar development work, promised that he'd be, he'd be kind of coming through with some stuff in the next year. Well, the next year, that was a year ago. So hopefully we'll hear about some announcements. But, you know, the walk from one square centimeter to one square mile is a lot of manufacturing. My friends at Heliovolt sort of learn that, it's, it's tough. Um, I think that the real, the, there will always be these incremental improvements and there have been some other materials improvements on crystalline and amorphous. The real value in solar uh, cost reduction seems to be focused on balance of systems now, efficient racking, uh, good inverters that are easy to connect, installation systems that can be installed quickly. Um, things that generally will come from economies of scale. So the best thing you can do to make solar more affordable for Avery is to buy it now, and if, you know, because this is a technology that runs on, on economies of manufacturing scale, unlike the power plant world, which ran on plant scale. So, um, and and I, think, I think with, gosh, billions of dollars now moving in the racking business, um, I think we're going to see a lot more efficiency in that. Finally, a place that the DOE is spending a lot of time on, a lot of other people are playing, spending on, and you have direct control over are the so-called soft costs, permitting, uh, processes of you know, approval, uh, all of the stuff associated with getting the deal, a lot of it associated with the efficiency of your supply chain, not just the products in it, but sort of getting enough volume that people can organize. I'm really excited. There's this new crop of businesses who were really an old crop of businesses called distributors 
that are coming in and they're basically saying, we'll sort the best modules and inverters and racks and stuff for you and we'll give you an idea of what fits best for the project you're doing. And while they were seen as sort of pernicious middlemen a few years ago, they're actually demonstrating a real lot of value in this sort of, I don't want to say frothy, but more excited market. So those are the three areas. Thin film, three, five areas, um, balance of system technology improvements, and then value chain and soft costs. Isn't the thin film much less efficient? Yes. Taking much bigger area. Yes. So people don't have it on their houses. Right. That's why, that's why it'll, if, even if it shows up with efficiency improvements, I think it'll be in the, the big utility scale stuff out in the desert. Exactly right. Yes, ma'am. I am an independent energy advocate both here and in California. Okay. And um, I spent a lot of time listening to the Cal ISO, you know, conferences, like 10 hours, you know, at a time. And, and I'm really, really puzzled and perplexed and really curious in many ways about some of the things you've said. Because in California, the, the kind of strides that are being taken are, are you may be familiar with the term in, um, integrated demand side management, uh -huh. which is, you know, all the, all the cool stuff, the transformation that we all right. want to see. And I think most of the people in the room want to see like 50% plus right. renewable energy, including me and she. And that means we have to integrate that. You're, I think you're completely right that at 2% or 1% solar, we're not seeing those problems. But I mean, who are you talking to at Cal ISO? Because they're seeing the problems, they're seeing them coming in 2015. And, and with the rate that, you know, my daughter sells for some so I mean, right. I, it's not like I, but, and so I'm really, really curious why you aren't advocating for load shifting into the solar hours, because that's what all the talk is out there. Then you, you know, then you eliminate the, the evening ramp, which the, the peak time, both here and in California, is right. in the evening after the sun goes down. It's great to use that energy at 3 o'clock when it's just maxing out. I, I can't even almost believe you said that. I'm like, it's so counterintuitive, maybe from a cost thing. So I'd like you to talk a little bit about that, the real cost of integrating once you get into the areas like what we want, of really 50 plus renewable energy was a lot of that being solar. And then the other, um, the other okay. question is, the, yeah. okay, that, that was okay. one. the other is, if Boulder municipalizes, and let's say that's five years from now, and let's say by then 15% of Boulder is net metering, they have to take over those contracts. Those customers essentially really are not going to be paying for the infrastructure that the city is buying. How do you address that? Wh whose contracts? Well, like let, let's say let's say Boulder buys the uh, the Excel system for right. two hundred okay. million. Okay. Right. If if it's let's say which what we all want, the city wants to beef up solar now, right? right. They're going to have to take over those contracts almost certainly, or they want to, right? right. I mean, do you think they would want to because they want the sold, they want the renewable energy, right? So that's maybe an open question. It's at the PUC right now that they're going to be reviewing it. But then if those customers, the city then has to pay the retail rate, right, right. they're not going to be paying for the wires and poles that the city has to buy it for hundreds of millions of dollars. So how yeah, do you right. address right. that? Right. Like municipal utilities, even the American Public Power Association, you probably know this, two days ago, it issued a statement about net metering saying, we're in trouble, guys. Basically, we need to get ready for this. They even advocated for more nuclear. OK. Yes. okay. All right. So yeah, I, I, um, OK, so the first one, the, yeah, well, the, the Cal ISO thing and the, and the integration thing is, 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 is interesting. And because what California and the, the geeks out there have a, a, this duck bill chart that they've published at it. And it basically shows that the more solar you get, the more you suppress the amount of generation you need from the system. But then, the minute the sun goes down, they're all going to be using back up here. So what used to be a, you know, what used to be a rise like this, because it always happens, right? A rise like this is now a rise like this. And it's shaped like a duck's neck. And they're saying, oh my god, that snapback thing, everything's going to have to come on fast. And there's some legitimate concern there. I mean, you turn on power plants real fast. Some power plants don't respond that much. The system is sort of stressed by this. Um, the answer, I never heard anybody say that the answer is that if, if we just use more electricity during the peak time, then the belly of the duck wouldn't go so deep, and so we'd have less snapback. But I guess that's true. Um, I, it, that's a little counterintuitive. From, from my point of view with sort of ozone formation and things like that, but, but um, it, it was one of the things we worried about sort of like in Texas, running stuff 
in the hot afternoon. But there's, the real issue is the amplitude of the snapback. And the question is not, the answer is not, I don't think necessarily to do less solar or even to make the solar worth less by shifting all the load there. It's things like, how do you control the customers coming back on? So the integrated approaches are right. Uh, how do we do demand response so that the, that demand is controlled? How do you do pre-cooling? And then, of course, the California Commission has been ordering a lot of storage and saying, well, if we can use storage, we can even out those rises and, and falls in consumption by sort of playing up against the batteries and stuff. Um, take it to another step. These California issues are look to be serious enough to be severe. Serious people are taking them seriously, so they must be. They are at a much higher level of penetration than we're talking about. In most places, we're talking fractions of a percent. I know, but it also, those analyses take into, don't take into account a whole bunch of other things. They don't take into account the management of complementary technologies. They don't take into account the geographical, um, the geographical capacity improvements and system improvements that come from having more solar in a wider number of places. They don't, they don't take into account the co-development of technologies and management techniques and distribution automation, distribution management systems that also will be taken <laughs> if we don't go rushing headlong into it. So I'm, whole, I'm, not a, I'm not a total technological optimist, but I think that California will teach us a lot of lessons about what things we should put in place as we go forward, as will Hawaii. And don't they service as well? You've yes, that yes, before. they do. And then, and, and, and what was the second one? The second one? The, in, the, the Oh, yeah, okay, that one, that one is, is just sort of, I mean, that question is kind of philosophical, right? You know, it's sort of like if the utility takes it over, then the utility can't stand to have any customers using less electricity because it's counting on all your use of electricity in order to pay the bills for what they took over. And, 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 and that's not what you said, but I'm sort of playing it out at the extreme level. Then don't do it, right? I mean, if, if the only thing you can do is just same, you meet the new boss same as the old boss, then it's a questionable proposition. But I think that from what I've seen in the preliminary analysis already so far, you can not quite have your cake and eat it too, but you can, first of all, work like hell to make sure that you only pay for the system at a fair price and what you need. And I think a lot of good thinking is going into that. And second of all, figure out how to create enough headroom for you to, to build and layer in this new model that says we're not going to be stuck on that same old asset spin the, spin the meter model of doing business. Maybe we can make these assets last longer than we thought. You know, if, if a little bit of conservation in everybody's house makes that transmission line last 30 years instead of 20 years, as the utility would have had it done, then you just busted the game, right? You just showed, all right, that was a good deal. In the, I have to believe that the assets in the hands of smart boulder management are worth more. They have higher value than the cost you will pay, or else you shouldn't do it. So that's. The short answer is that paying off the bonds is a small part of the utility rates, and the analysis has been done, yeah. and it's a very small yeah. uh, impact. Right. But, it, but it's a good, but I want to say it's a really good warning signal that you don't want to just have, form a utility so you can create something that's just as addicted to the same behaviors. Now, you need to have your eyes wide open. Because, because you, you do have paths to choose here, and you should choose a path that says, I'm breaking, I'm breaking out of this paradigm. OK, we're going to keep moving. We're, sorry, sorry. But yes? As architectural engineers, you know, we want to design good quality buildings, green, right. and good systems in buildings. Um, and, uh, and, and let's say every building that we build or design has some aspect of solar on it. But every building owner and operator has to figure in an engineered uh, uh, amortization of the various systems, mm -hmm. like heating systems, right. appliances, and roofs, and so on. Uh, I know there's a lot of different manufacturers of uh, solar panels, and some might be 
street, some might be Joe. Um, what, have you done any studies as to what the amortized cost or life expectancy from an engineering perspective of the average solar panel that's of decent quality? 15 years, yeah. 10 I, years, or 20 years before they have to be replaced. Right. I've, I, it's, it's funny you ask that because I actually submitted testimony in Virginia about that. Um, you haven't been around long enough to really. Well, we actually have panels that, are, that have been out 40 years. Uh, the NREL does have live, continuous running data on panels that have been running 40 years. We, the vast majority of panels out there have a 25 year production warranty on them. And sort of just given the way commerce works, I would expect they would have a longer useful life than the warranty because that's, you know, it's bad business to warrant for longer than you think the system's going to last or else you're, you'll go broke, right? Yeah, there's, um, the, the, there's a bunch of studies that I looked at that say that the, today's solar modules, you know, given current states of production and class, you know, high class quality modules, 30 years is reasonable, and we should probably be doing sensitivities in our value of solar analysis for 35 year lives and stuff, because they probably are going to be contributing value. Now, there is a known average degradation factor, right, that's out, that, that most people today assume, about a half a percent per year, I think, is, is the number. And um, that's, that's what people are sort of assuming. But I will also turn the turn the question over because Megan should answer questions too. Not in this session, but you should find her later or other people who are solar experts. I'm just kidding with Megan. But, but um, because people are financing these things. And I can tell you, the guys who are really picky about the longevity and the performance of the modules are the guys that put their money on the line for long periods of time, the people that invest in companies like theirs. So, yeah. 28 years ago, I built an eight-unit solar apartment. Uh -huh. At concentrating iconic collectors. Okay, right. The whole so system's thermal. still operating. Yeah. But, you know, the boilers have to be replaced. Sure, the yeah, the wear and tear. But uh, that to sell a house, right. you have to give the customer some kind of idea as to how long their heating yeah. system's going to last, how long their completely and <coughs> completely legitimate point i've got a son who's an appraiser and i can tell you they're starting to sort of figure that out as well and the uh, anecdotal evidence at least i think is primarily from california is that solar houses enabled houses are selling at a premium six thousand dollars yeah. i knew she'd know <laughs> six thousand dollar average premium per kilowatt so all right thanks <laughs> How do you uh, think about value-based rates when you start adding more than just solar, like vehicle to grid or fuel cell, microgrid at, at SQL or something like that? Do you think about it? Yeah. I think, I, I think essentially what's happening is what we're talking about multiplying the number of transactions. Right? I mean, it's really what we're saying is that there's a transaction here and it should be transacted at this value, transaction at this value, this value. That's the first way to sort of break it down. When we did, when we started talking seriously about deregulation and the electric and more, first like in the, in the telephone business, we, we talked about sort of complete unbundling. If you follow the utility business lately, instead of trying to come up with one gloppy value rate for everything, we've, we've always said, well, what's the energy value, the capacity value, the transmission value, and then we allocate those appropriately. Well, we can, un we can unbundle those cost elements to even finer detail so that we can start getting at things. Like, you know, if your car battery connected so it can flow to the grid, can provide ancillary services, then there is the potential for that transaction. Now, while our analysis needs to break down into lots and lots of transactions, customers obviously shouldn't have to go through that. We need to aggregate those back up. And I think that's what sort of the utility, the the utility of the future will do. They'll sit there and they'll say, given all the things I can take and give to you as an electric vehicle or as a um, uh, radio controlled thermostat, you know, or, or whatever, grid, cloud controlled thermostat, given all the things I can do with you by, by that, it's worth an average of X to me every year or every month. And we'll say, you put a V to G, vehicle to grid enabled car on the grid and every hour it's connected, I will give you $25.
It will be the summation of all those transactions. Taking my excess when I need it bled off, solving the duck bill problem, you know, uh, selling me some juice when I want to slow down the ramp on my gas plant, solving the duck bill problem. Uh, you know, all, the, all those things and I'll just come up with a value component. Excel did that to me the first time I lived in Colorado when they came out and said, here's $25, I'm putting a controller in your air conditioner. Do you think it's still above the retail rate, even if you add like if there's you know, gas as part of it, for example? I mean, it, it all depends on the resource, right? Solar distributed is worth more to me because it's a premium value product that gives you everything, you know, Phil's example, everything that makes the toast just as brown, but it's also climate proof and waterproof and fuel price volatility proof, so it's a premium product. Some things may not go that way, right? There's some things may not have, it, it's equation of the retail value will start to sort of attenuate. I mean, the, what's the worth of, a, of a, Nest con, a Nest thermostat, you know, a sort of a cloud controlled thermostat? Well, you're gonna get slices of value according to market prices during the moments when that technology can deliver a benefit. The real question is whether the price point for that technology summed against that value sort of breaks even, right? We get to that indifference point. So if the Nest thermostat costs $100, or what are they, $200? If I pay you, if, if the energy you save me by allowing me to cycle your air conditioner off on demand is at or below $200, then I won't, then it's not a good proposition for me. It's at or above, hell, I'll buy it for you, right? And that's, that'll be the transactional nature that comes into it. A lot of people describe the utility of the future as being sort of a concierge. You know, sort of, I know all the good places for you to eat. You know, you tell me what your flavor of demand is. I will match you perfectly. And maybe I'll take a little bit, you know, back from the waiter for send, or from the maitre d' for sending you over there. So we have about five minutes left, so there's, I think, two more questions, and then we'll stop there. Uh, so, you know, imagine you implement this policy effectively, um, and you get a lot of growth in distributed solar, and you get a lot of growth in distributed solar installations in an environment of flat load growth like we have in Colorado and many other places, right. um, you're going to start displacing existing uh, generation resources, uh, probably peaking generation resources first, and then digging into other kind of legacy uh, investments that the utilities have made. Okay. How do you go about compensating utilities for that? Do you do that? Who ends up paying for those resources that maybe we don't want to have operated anymore. What's right. the most cost-effective, kind of politically yeah. tenable way to do that? Uh, well, the most cost-effective way to do it is have somebody else pay. <laughs> I thought of that myself. No. I think somebody else thought of that for me. Those are what we call in finance sunk costs, right? I mean, and then we, in the utility world, we call them stranded costs. They've been stranded. Costs have been stranded by technology and customer demand and general economic conditions and weather patterns for the entire existence of the utility industry. Um, the damn car stranded the cost of investment in buggy whip manufacturing plants, but that wasn't a regulated industry. Uh, so utilities have a tendency to, to invoke this thing called the Constitution, in which they say that, and they're right, according to Supreme Court precedent, they have a constitutional right, or else it'll be a taking, to a reasonable opportunity to earn a reasonable rate of return on their investments. That's the deal we struck with them. We said, you organize the shareholders, you amass the capital, you build the infrastructure, and we will give you a reasonable opportunity, opportunity to earn a reasonable return on your investments. They're entitled to that. There's a long settled line of constitutional law, Supreme Court decisions to that effect. But the rub is, Two things. First of all, all the calculation of what's reasonable and what, what's a reasonable opportunity and what's a reasonable rate of return. Right? We don't have to gold plate it, you know, and et cetera, et cetera. But it is legitimate. I mean, it is, there's, a, there's a, a calculation and analysis to be done, much like the analysis that a boulder will have to go through or the courts will go through when they review the takings or condemnation or purchase or whatever transaction it ultimately takes. But the other thing that's really important, I mentioned this in the group earlier, the other thing that's really important is to not assign those stranded costs to the new market entrant, right? That's a, the, what incumbents want to do is say, you know, look, uh, you know, 
what if if I can't run my coal plant and it's a hundred million dollars, I want you know a, a dollar added to the next one million solar projects that come in. Because damn it, they're the ones that caused me that hundred million dollar loss on my coal plant. That's financial error 101. You don't do that. And, uh, and I and I cited a, a good friend of mine. There's a I, I, I think it's on my on one of my blog entries, but but um, Peter Ke Kelly Detweiler analogized nuclear power plant investment and failed quarterbacks. You know, and his analogy was if you paid four million dollars for a Mark Sanchez and he just ain't doing good, you don't subtract four million dollars from the paycheck of the next quarterback you want to hire <laughs> and think you're going to win the Super Bowl. It just doesn't happen, right? You deal with your sunk costs, your stranded costs, whatever is appropriate, but you don't tack that on or subtract it from the paycheck for the replacement quarterback because you will never become a winning team. We don't do that in finance. We don't, sunk costs are sunk. They are not attributed to new investment calculations. The value of a new investment is the value of the new investment. It is not the value of new investment net your previous mistakes. And keeping the accounting straight is important. Like I said, I'm not denying that the law will have something to say about an investment that's been made obsolete or stranded. But I will tell you, the precedent for new technology causing actual stranded costs, not so much. What's caused strands, what causes stranded costs are rapid changes in policy by the government, right? where you mess with their reasonable investment back expectations, to use a takings law phrase. I'm not, a I'm not talking as a lawyer, but I did study it once. You know, and that means that regulators cause those kinds of problems. Now, whether or not municipalization would equate to that, I'm not so sure. <laughs> or a write down. You know, I'm sorry. I mean. The reason you've been earning, you know, the thing to say, the, the sort of mean thing to say to a stockholder, I'm sorry to say, but I've been a stockholder, so, you know, on things, not never really utility, but the mean thing to say is the reason why I've been giving you 10% rate of return on your investment every year for the last 20 years is because there was always a risk that you would not earn 10%, right? That was why we did that. So now that it's actually happening, you can't get mad at me that the thing I was paying you for has happened. It just, you know. So, okay. Last question. You've been waiting so patiently. Uh, thank you so much for coming. I don't know about anything else, but I How many parts to the question? I thoroughly enjoy it. Um, it's going to actually be really easy. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> you can uh, let down. So, uh, I don't know. It's one of the things I love about Boulder is where, like, we have all this open space, and then we argue about, well, do we get to play with it this way or play with it that way? Yeah, yeah. And so with solar, it's sort of I felt the same way that we have this incredible opportunity to even have these questions. And what is value and how do you think about that? That. Right. So, um, sort of a little infomercial. If you happen to like this concept, if you happen to like the idea of maybe being able to do a lot of solar letters to the editor, the Daily Camera would be very helpful. Sure. Open forum at dailycamera.com. And then the question is really, you began by saying something to the effect of it would be easier with a municipal utility. And I wondered if you could, you've been on all sides yeah. of the utility picture and the regulator picture and everything else. And I wondered if you could just you know, we're kind of tired, but a little yeah. bit on why that you think that would be. I think it really, I mean, the, the guys from the Public Power Association have this right. It is about direct control. It's direct accountability. It's communication. It's, you know, if I proposed a boneheaded idea, um, you know, my solar uh, installers just walked right over to City Hall, you know, and said, hey, Look what Rabaga's doing now, you know? And it may have even happened a time or two, uh, uh, you know? Uh, so, so there is that ability to have a conversation, the ability to see the, peop the, the, the board members of your utility in your community, s bump into them on the street, at the shopping center, whatever it is, is a pretty powerful thing, you know? You, when you go to Wall Street and you talk to an analyst and he tells you what you're supposed to do regarding performance of the stock and all that sort of stuff, or you go to a third-party investor, you know, 
some unknown equity investor like TXU has who's just got some expectation of returns, you're going to have a conversation that is very less, much, much less nuanced and, and, and very narrowly constrained around what's my return and how am I going to get it, right? You can have a different conversation when, when the management is, is local, unless you screw it up, by the way. I mean, I will tell you, that I, 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 the nice thing about being an independent consultant, I can say these things. In Austin, we, our board was our city council. In San Antonio, they interposed a professional board, which included a bunch of, you know, forgive me, but sort of male, pale, stale, retired banker types, you know, there were a few exceptions, but who's, who, who let San Antonio buy into nukes and coal plants because it gave them excellent golfing partners, I think, you know, or something. So there's a, there's a you can screw up even a municipal deal. But I will tell you, it was really funny when, when Solar San Antonio tried to do that one thing Megan was talking about, which is, you know, jimmy the calculation and call it value of solar. It really wasn't, but they slapped the label on it. The mayor got involved and put the brakes on for a year. We're waiting to see if it resulted in any real change. But you can screw it up at a city level if you, if you insulate the management too much. Um, the other thing is that you will tend to draw from your local employment pool, which means that your, you know, your employees, and this is true with Excel as well, but it'll be even more true with a municipal utility, just because as people you know, increasingly want to work near the place they live, and that will create a loyalty. Um, my, the people in my distributed energy services group had a volunteer hours rate that was unbelievable. They were all heavily engaged in the community, and not all in electricity things, I mean, seldom. They were in a whole bunch of other activities. And that also meant that if they were at a barbecue, they were to get yelled at, you know? What are you people doing over there, you know, kind of thing. And that was even, maybe even more powerful than being able to go to your board member at the city council meeting, uh, because then they'd come up and say, you know, Carl, what did you do this time? I got it both ways. You know. and so so I, it really does come down to that. And keeping that, and keeping the opportunity for the public to be involved, and keeping, we had a Citizens Electric Utility Commission, a Citizens Resource Management Commission, citizen commissions that, that people served on, all those local, contact points kept it a community enterprise. Um, and then the, other, the last thing I'll say is, I mentioned sort of before, hiring locally. Try to hire your leadership locally uh, because they, if they've been around a while, they generally have a flavor for the culture of the place and you'd be surprised how deep the culture goes. And then I will say one last thing. I'll tell you this story. It was really, it's kind of an, a funny story, but it, I think it's really serious. It winds all the way back to this utility transformation thing. Um, when I first arrived at, at Austin Energy, I was invited to attend the first ever joint meeting of the executive team, and I was as a new member of the executive team, and the diversity committee. And um, I went in with a little bit of trepidation, you know, I'm pretty used to what sort of diversity committee meetings are like, you know, there's a lot of people with hurt feelings, voicing, finally getting a chance to voice their feelings. We thought, well, they've been meeting for a while, they probably boiled this all up, there's going to be something about we don't appreciate you know, women enough, or, or people of color enough, or this enough, or that enough. And I was ready for all the sort of standard stuff, and I gotta admit I was a little bit, I walked in a little bit prickly. It was funny, it was hilarious to me inside because none of that was true. I mean, we had some issues, there was a, some white guys at a power plant that were a little bit too clicky, and there was some African Americans in the, you know, resource management or something. There was, there was a couple little things that we needed to work on, but they were sort of curable with, you know, sort of ordinary skills of good management. But what was ripping us apart, was, was tearing us apart, was the divide between green and non-green. The guys who said, I climb the poles every day and I keep the transformers in line and I don't get no credit for it and a damn solar system gets a press release every time somebody puts one up. You know, and that was our corporate cultural dilemma, our diversity problem. You were in or out of the green or non-green group. And I, I, I mention it to you because I think as you take control of your utility des destiny, You've already seen inklings of that divide. It's a, maybe it's a popular divide for people to foment. It's a, maybe it's a wedge place that people think they can use to, to divide us, those who care about the environment, the future, and the open spaces, and those who don't, 
and however you characterize it. Those are people who are wackos and those people who are responsible, using labels all over the place. Guard against that. Be proactive in addressing that diversity question now because you need the optimal skills of all those people. You'll need the optimal skills of your linemen and the optimal skills of your rate analysts. And your, and your general manager shouldn't be, have to spend their time managing those debates, but rather spending time focusing on what customers want and how they're going to take advantage of new things. That, if, if there's a bit of cultural guidance I can give you, be proactive. Um, well, all, a thousand corporate management techniques, right? Rotation, uh, team building, um, you know, assignment, just all the standard stuff. But maybe the first step is recognize that there will be this potential division. Uh, as you have, should recognize with every potential division, these are all diversity skills, right? Diversity management skills. And boy, our diversity firm uh, that we hired, the consulting firm, if you want a really good consulting firm, these guys were outstanding. Uh, yeah, if you get to that point. So they, they're the ones that opened my eyes on this. Thank you so much for your Thank attention. You. Thank you. I appreciate it.